Yes, my name is Mitchell Gomez. Uh, I'm the executive director of DanceSafe. Uh, sitting here uh, on a lonely land, uh, on a stage that MLK spoke on for the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, feeling a lot of gravity of the, of the space. It's a really uh, amazing place to be here. And so, yeah, I wanted to thank Dave and the rest of the church, uh, the people who have maintained this building, all the event volunteers, the speakers, you guys for being here. I'm just uh, really overwhelmed with gratitude to be here. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, DanceSafe was founded in 1998 uh, here in San Francisco. Uh, we are no longer based here, but this is where this was born. Um, we started the first and for many decades the only publicly accessible drug checking laboratory in the United States. Uh, it's now managed by Irowid. Uh, it's hosted at drugsdata.org. Uh, and you can mail your drugs in. They have a DEA Schedule One receiving license. Uh, they run it through some very expensive analytical equipment and then put it on the website and you can see what your drugs were. Uh, because drug adulteration has been a problem for a long, long time. Uh, from that, we expanded into an on-site drug checking nonprofit that does a lot of, uh, a lot of other amazing health education stuff. Uh, everything from drug education, sexual health and consent deep dives, political advo advocacy, uh, and our incredible volunteers distribute information at booths all over the country. Uh, we're at about 1,500 volunteers now, uh, all throughout the United States. I hate doing notes, but I just had to do it for this talk. Uh, and we believe in the transformative power of people helping people. And my personal harm reduction story really starts because I was really, really bad at practicing harm reduction when I first discovered drugs. Uh, I first discovered the idea of psychedelics when I was uh, 11 or 12. I found a copy of Larry and Metzner's uh, psychedelic manual that was based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead in my local public library. And it was the first time as a child uh, that I really sort of understood what drugs were. At 11, I thought of drugs as things that made you go faster or made you go slower. That was like my sort of whole understanding of, of drugs at 11. And I'll never forget reading this book and coming across this paragraph where Timothy Leary is talking about looking at this uh, plant in his office and watching it like melt into the floor. And I read that paragraph over and over and over again because I couldn't understand what he was saying. And it was my first sort of inkling as a child that our perception of reality is not, in fact, itself reality, right? That there's this step out from what is real in our perception and that you can alter that. And man, I was immediately fascinated by the idea of psychedelics. I mean, it was just something I was immediately drawn to. Uh, but I thought psychedelics were a thing that had been wiped out. I thought LSD had existed in the 60s, but the police had effectively destroyed it. And then when I was 13, I was in, in school, and there was a, a, a D.A.R.E. officer who came to visit us in school, and he talked about the, the dangers of this thing called LSD, and you know, how you should avoid it, and it could make you, you know, all sorts of nonsense that you know, D.A.R.E. used to say, and has gotten slowly better about, but is still not great. And I had some follow-up questions about the sort of people to avoid if I didn't want to be exposed to these dangerous substances, right? I was like, all right, who should I not be? spending time with. Uh, and the officer mentioned raves. Uh, and it took me six weeks. It was the weekend after my 14th birthday that I attended my first rave. Uh, nobody would sell fat, goth, high school Mitchell any drugs, but I did find some pills on the ground uh, and took them. Uh, and so, yeah, it's really, uh, I'm constantly motivated by the fact that I'm really alive because of timing. You know, drug markets were not as dangerous in the late 1990s as they are now. Uh, and so, yeah, this has been an accelerating problem uh, and one that I have a lot of personal motivation for. Uh, I look at pictures of my old rave crew and the, the number of people who aren't here anymore is just a never-ending source of motivation for me to uh, continue the work. And I do a lot of public talking, uh, but I decided for this talk, because of the theme of the conference, uh, because of a lot of conversations I've had with Dave over, over the last couple years of getting to know him, uh, I wanted to stretch my, my talk a little bit in a way that I've never really spoken about. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different religious and spiritual tr traditions uh, that have moral principles that I believe can call us to psychedelics, to harm reduction, to ending the drug war, uh, but wanted to talk about the ones that sort of really resonate with me. Uh, my mother's family are Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, they came over just before World War I when the pogroms were happening against Jewish communities uh, in Russia, Ukraine, Prussia, 
Uh, so survived the Shoah, but all of the records of my family end at the Holocaust on that side of my family. Uh, my father's family are uh, Sephardic Jews from Portugal and Spain who were kicked out by the Spanish Inquisition uh, in what is now New Mexico by 1604 uh, and very, very often married into indigenous families. It was safer for a secret Jew to marry a Native American than it was to marry a Catholic. Uh, and so I ended up with a, a huge amount of uh, indigenous ancestry but was really raised primarily within the Jewish tradition, and so that's the one I wanted to talk about. But I did want to give one nod to one specific ancestor of mine. Uh, Maria de Zamora uh, was a Nahua uh, native, so what we would now call Aztec, uh, came into New Mexico with the Spanish. Uh, and in 1607, uh, it was actually this last December, like December, so December 1607, uh, was arrested by the Spanish Inquisition in Santa Fe for uh, practicing indigenous religion uh, using what they called peyotal, uh, which now would be translated as peyote, but at the time actually meant any mind-altering substance. So it's not entirely clear. It may have been peyote, it may have been psilocybin, datura, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, but it does mean that we are now coming up on the 418th anniversary of family members of mine being arrested for drug crimes in what is now the United States. Uh, and so I did want to give a, note, a nod to Maria de Zamora. <laughs> And yeah, I really, really do, I want to keep an eye on the time because uh, everyone's running late. Oh, I'm doing great. This is amazing. <laughs> um, I really do believe that uh, not just around psychedelics, but the drug war as a system uh, is fundamentally evil. I think that it fails in what it claims to do. I believe it's deeply immoral. Um, I believe a lot of the people who are enforcing these laws are it being intentionally disingenuous about their reasons. Uh, and so whatever your uh, religious, oh, <laughs> um, whatever your religious tradition is, uh, I truly believe there are very valid reasons to end the drug war. And I want to talk about a couple of those, and then I'll, I'll share some uh, lessons from my, my Jewish upbringing and my Jewish morality that I think are really applicable. Uh, we are now, uh, the media often says we are now in the middle of a fentanyl crisis. Uh, my deepest, deepest fear, but one that I think is really rooted in reality, is that we are in fact at the very, very, very beginning of a synthetic psychoactive drug crisis. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near the middle. Uh, and this is a dynamic that has been created, driven, exacerbated entirely by drug prohibition. Uh, when Donald Trump announced his candidacy the first time, I wrote a public piece that said, if Trump won the nomination, won the election, and got money for the border wall, for every mile of wall built, we would see an increase in synthetic opiate deaths. Right? As you make it harder and harder to smuggle heroin, drug sellers would switch to more potent analogs because doses per smuggled shoebox becomes like the single most important metric. Throughout my entire life, I've always been really happy when I'm like smart enough to predict the future. This was the first time in my life I was gutted to be right. Um, it was really sad because this was not just predictable, it was predicted. Uh, uh, Leonard Pelt, uh, not Leonard Pelt, sorry, uh, Leonard Picker was writing about the possibility of a fentanyl crisis in, by like 1994. We've known for a long time that this was coming, that prohibition would be driving it. And even if you don't do drugs, even if you don't consume drugs that are sometimes adulterated with other drugs, uh, the drug war is dangerous to society as a whole. Uh, it's eroded our Fourth Amendment right to be free from search and seizure to the point that it might as well not exist. Uh, drug dogs have been shown to be wrong more than 50% of the time, which means it would be less of a civil rights violation to let the police flip a quarter and decide whether to search you or not. Like, at least that's 50-50, right? So, like, that would, you know, maybe be better. Uh, you know, there's been countless cases of people who had no involvement in the drug trade whatsoever, having their doors kicked down, being shot, uh, often having evidence planted against them. There have been many high-profile cases. Like, literally, if you uh, Google, you know, false drug planted after raid, like, you have to scroll pages and pages and pages of information. This is, like, a really common thing. And one of the saddest ones is how deeply it undermines public trust in the idea of, like, fair governance and fair policing. Uh, there's no real fundamental reason uh, that law enforcement has to behave the way they do, uh, other than the fact that it's necessary to enforce prohibition. 
most crimes have a victim who reports that crime to law enforcement, is cooperating with the investigation. It doesn't require these sorts of dirty tactics that are required to enforce drug prohibition when there are no victims in the sense that, you know, we mean there's obviously people harmed. It also acts as this incredible poverty trap. Uh, you know, once you're a convicted felon, you are excluded from public housing, uh, you know, public food assistance in many states, student loans for a long time, although there has been a lot of progress on, on that front. It used to be that any drug felony, you were barred for life uh, from getting a student loan. Um, that has been slowly changing. Uh, and when you combine that with the racial disparity in drug war enforcement, uh, you end up with a system that Michelle Alexander very rightly called the new Jim Crow. That this was a system that was designed to replace Jim Crow as a form of, of racialized control. Uh, there are, in absolute numbers, it is undeniable, there are more white users and sellers of drugs, and yet the arrest data for possession and distribution has never mirrored what we know is the reality of drug distribution in this country. We all know that stop and frisk, if it had been done outside of bars on a Friday night near Wall Street, would have been tremendously successful at finding cocaine. Everybody knows this. Uh, there is a reason they didn't do that, because those people can fuck with them back. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we had years in New York where if you took the number of young African-American and Latino men in New York City, and then you looked at the stop and frisk records of young African-American and Latinos, the average number of stop and frisks was like 2.3, right? So everybody who was in that demographic was getting searched multiple times every year. And the bars on Wall Street, the parties at Columbia, like none of those were getting touched. And it also fuels just really horrific violence abroad. Uh, if we take away this money from you know, criminal underworlds, it's a huge, huge, huge source of revenue. By some metrics, the drug industry might be the third largest like, uh, commodities economy on the planet. Uh, it's like oil and gas, food, and drugs. Uh, and so you know, when you leave that in the hands of, exclusively in the hands of people who have to use violence in order to enforce contracts, in order to take over new areas. There's a reason the last time one craft brewery in this country shot up another was in the 1930s, right? If you remove the ability for people to engage in legal dispute mechanisms, the only people left are those who are willing to engage in extra legal dispute mechanisms. Uh, and so even if you're not into these drugs, even if you're not into drugs at all, uh, the drug war is hurting you. It's hurting our our communities, it's, it's especially hurting you know, young people of color, uh, and so there are a lot of reasons to end it. Uh, but like I said, I was raised you know, primarily in a, a Jewish home. Uh, I was actually, uh, my grandfather and grandmother, I feel, uh, had a lot of shame around their uh, indigenous ancestry. It was not a thing that they were proud of. Um, there are places where Native Americans didn't get the right to vote in state elections till the 1950s. This is not like ancient history. There was like a real, real deep racism. Uh, and so I was not raised with this knowledge. I've been reconnecting as an adult and I've been really touched by my distant family who are, you know, enrolled in various nations and some state recognized tribes for being so open and welcoming. But I really wanted to focus on Judaism because it was the, the way that I was raised and the way that my morality was really formed. Um, so the four principles I really wanted to talk about were tikkun olam, pekua nefesh, gimlu chasadim, and bracha levata. And we'll get to each of them. And I'll try to avoid Hebrew because I'm terrible at it, to be really frank. Uh, tikkun olam is maybe my favorite, one of my favorite Jewish principles. Actually, all four of these are really up on the top ten. Uh, tikkun olam is a, a moral obligation within Judaism to repair and improve the world. Uh, I often say that there is actually no such thing as a Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, Judaism demands that we are the ones in charge of repairing the world, uh, which is a really diametrically quite far from the sort of Christian tradition of uh, faith alone. And when you center the sanctity of human life, human well-being, and you look at the drug war, they're irreconcilable. We are required to repair the world. The drug war is causing all of these harms. And so we are called to, to create a world in which these harms are no longer in place. Uh, and I'm not saying that selling heroin at 7-Eleven is necessarily the move. Necessarily the move. I, I'm not, there's a million different regulatory models for all sorts of different drugs. Uh, 
I do genuinely believe if we sold heroin at 7-Eleven, less people would be dying from opiates than are dying right now from fentanyl. Uh, the data from the CDC was supposed to be out by this week. They are once again late. Uh, but I think that we are rapidly approaching three times the peak year of HIV deaths from all drugs in this country. So the peak year of HIV deaths was, I believe, 95 or 96. It was 45,000 people. Uh, and we are now rapidly approaching three times that number dying from drugs. And there was a time in this country when anybody could walk into a pharmacy and purchase heroin. Uh, they could purchase uh, amphetamines. This was a thing that was sold over the counter. And we had less people using them and less people dying. Uh, and so we have done that in this country before, and it worked to reduce the harms of these substances. Um, I actually have a lovely little bottle at my house of a product called Ipsandrine that was over the counter for many years in this country. It was a cough syrup for children uh, that was cherry flavoring and raw extract of ephedra and poppy. Like it was a cherry flavored speedball that you could buy over the counter. And this was like a legal product in this country for many, many years. It's an empty bottle, unfortunately, but that's what I could find. Um, Tikkun also centers this idea of true justice and true compassion. And for me, compassion is, I think, rooted in the radical empathy that comes from realizing that if you had been born in another person's body and lived that person's life, the odds are you would substantially be that person. Every person who makes decisions that you may deeply disagree with, if you were born as them and lived their life, you would likely be making those decisions. And when you combine that with the sort of psychedelic lesson that seems to come through for so many of us that underneath all of our biological processes and individual lives and the illusion of linear time and the illusion of separate space, uh, that we are all connected in a truly deep way, I think that means very clearly to me that we have to treat everyone with as much compassion as we possibly can. And ending the drug war is just the the biggest win I can imagine for improving the quality of human life in this country, for uh, ending racial disparities within the law enforcement system, and just a million other benefits. Uh, when I look at the, you can't even calculate the amount of money spent on the drug war, they divide it into so many different pies, but we're certainly talking about enough to forgive student loans and give every homeless person a house over the course of the drug war. Like no question, we're above that number. Uh, and so we're burning just mountains of resources for things that are just not appropriate. And the opposition that we often see to harm reduction, we saw this most sharply with the uh, rise of needle exchanges in the 1990s, where you know people were like, "Oh, just like let them get HIV. It's the it's the cure to the drug crisis, right? Just like let them use dirty needles." Like that was a rhetoric that Judge Judy used on TV, um, is that you know the, the the cure for drug addiction is to just distribute HIV infected needles. Like this is on this is Judge Judy. Like don't not a fan. Uh, it's such a uh, awful way of thinking about drugs and also kind of misses the fact that there's new drug users every day. Like it's just like, it's not only really, really evil, it's also kind of stupid. Uh, and so that attitude just has always bothered me. And so yeah, this, uh, this focus within Tikkun Olam on repairing the world, on having radical empathy and radical justice, I think really provides for me a, a moral framework, uh, which ties in with Pakua Nefesh, uh, which is a lesser known principle in Judaism, but one that I actually think should be wider known because it, it worked its way into British common law and then also into US law. Uh, Pakua Nefesh is a direct commandment within the Torah that says you can break any other commandment in the Torah if it is necessary to save a human life. There is no law which can prevent you from saving a life within Judaism. Um, and because commandments from the Torah are centered above uh, temporal stately law, uh, this to me says very clearly, right, I have a moral obligation to break the law to save a life. Uh, you know, DanSafe manufactures and distributes uh, testing equipment. Uh, they are considered drug paraphernalia in somewhere between 30 and 32 states. We have an intern updating our docs right now. Uh, and there's this meme that goes around, it says, badly describe your job. Uh, and the way I always describe it is that I break state and federal drug law and brag about it on Fox News. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm very okay with that because it came into US law as well as something called the necessity defense. Uh, this most often comes up when people run a red light to get to a hospital, right? If your actions were necessary to save a life, you can use that as a defense in court for the reason why you broke that law. Um, it does not prevent you from being arrested or charged. It's a, a defense that you can present to a jury. Uh, 
but one that I think is really important. Like, I, I like the fact that that is a part of our legal system. Because we do have to center this idea of human life being more important than the sort of minutia of whatever laws might exist. And when it comes to reducing, you know, if you want to really, really reduce other types of criminality, if you really want to save human lives, um, ending the drug war is just such a huge win. Uh, and one that feels like it should be relatively easy. I mean, I think at this point, it's clear to everyone that the drugs have won the drug war. Um, and so, you know, not continuing this, this fight that we have that is making it so difficult for people to access altered states of consciousness that I have personally benefited from so much, as I'm sure many of you have, um, but that are also just killing so many, just seems so, so easy. And I wasn't sure if I was gonna have time to, for this, this next little chunk, but I'm actually doing great on time. My favorite part of Pakul Nefesh is that in the case of uncertainty, you know, you're, you're looking at a situation, it's like, I don't wanna break Shabbos, but I like, feel like this person may be in danger, and so I wanna save their life. Uh, you are commanded to default to the idea that this person's life is in danger. And if it turns out their life wasn't in danger, you still did not violate Shabbos because of Pakul Nefesh. So even in cases where we're not sure that a thing would save a person's life, if you believe that it may be necessary, you can still, through Pakul Nefesh, you can, break, you can violate any other uh, commandment that's given. And boy, that has some interesting implications for how we operate like harm reduction services, right? This idea that like, we're not 100% sure this is gonna save the lives that we want it to, but like, I think a reasonable person would think it is, and I think this person's life is in danger, and so like, yeah, let's, let's do the thing, like let's do this, let's, let's break these laws. Uh, and there's people doing things like this. There are underground safe use facilities in areas where the government won't allow them to operate, where people can come and use opiates with medical supervision and Narcan. Um, and some of them are not all that secret. Some of the people do talks publicly about them. Uh, and I have so much tremendous respect for those folks uh, because realistically, uh, providing harm reduction services to rich raver kids is less controversial. It definitely shouldn't be, but it is. And so I have so much respect for those people who paved the way for these harm reduction services uh, that are really, really, really doing the work. Um, the next principle I want to talk about was Gamilu uh, Hasadim, which is this idea of acts of loving kindness. Uh, it's, in the Christian tradition, it's often uh, sort of linked with tithing. Uh, Judaism also has a, a moral principle of sharing, of using your money to improve the world, tzedakah, uh, but this is actually separated out within Judaism in a way that I really like. Uh, because this is not about charity. Uh, this is any deed motivated by, by compersion and the desire to help others. Uh, charity is a very specific time-bounded event, right? You're, you take the money, you give it to the person who needs it, the, trans the transaction is, is complete. Uh, with acts of loving kindness, it's really more about integrating that as a mental, operating system for how you interact with the world. Uh, this shows up in a lot of different ways in Judaism. Um, anything you do where you have a possibility or an expectation of some sort of reciprocity, even if it's within like reputational reciprocity, right? Like oh, I'm gonna give $500,000 to this opera house and I'm gonna get my name on the box. Like that is not gonna be chasadim. Like you are putting, like you're getting a reputational boost. It's not that. Um, you can offer these acts of loving kindness to the dead. Uh, one of the sort of highest acts of, of this principle is to wash and prepare the body of someone who has passed who has no one else to do it for burial. Um, talk about no possibility of reciprocity, right? I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate example of like no possibility of reciprocity is kindness to those who have passed. Uh, it's often explicitly bounded as not being about money because with money, different levels of wealth, by definition, imply different levels of ability to perform that act. This is not that. This is a thing that each of us can do. Every interaction, every moment of every day is approach the world with loving kindness, think how can my actions either improve or harm the lives of those around me, uh, it's a way of looking at the world, not necessarily these individual acts.
And it's also very explicit within the, the sort of Jewish tradition that this is a thing, charity often implies helping those who are like, I don't want to say less than you, but maybe less resourced than you are having a hard time. Uh, this is a thing that transcends uh, economic you know, stratification, you know, power dynamics. You can offer love and kindness to a rich person as easily as you can to a poor person. You can offer it as easily to a person who's putting handcuffs on you as they're arresting you as you can to a person on the street asking for money for uh, you know, food for the day. It's simply a way of relating to the world, of, of recognizing that all people are people living their lives the, the best they can and that we can, as individuals, recognize that, uh, live that, and approach the world that way. Uh, it's a thing I try very, very hard to do in person and have an awfully hard time to do when like trolling people on the internet. And I'm trying to be better. I really, really am. Um, but in my day-to-day -day interactions, it's a thing I really deeply appreciate and really try to care for. I definitely saw some of my coworkers uh, knowingly smile when I said that. They see my social media presence, so. Um. <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about, and I think I'm actually quite good on time, which means we may make up for some of the, the time that was lost by starting a little late. Uh, Bracha Levatla is a, a, a principle that I think is the hardest one to explain to somebody who was not raised within Judaism, but one that I felt was really, really important and that I gave a lot of time to. Um, and it may be the single sharpest point of divergence between Judaism and Christianity. Uh, this is the sin of offering a prayer for something and then not working to the outcome of that prayer. Within Judaism, thoughts and prayers alone are a sin. Uh, you must work towards the goals that you are claiming you want to see in the world. This is a requirement within, within Judaism. And man, it's just one of my favorite things about this religion. And I have plenty of criticisms. Uh, I really, really do particularly about how Judaism has been co-opted as a political movement. It, it deeply concerns me and deeply offends me as, as a Jew. But this principle, I think, if it had survived into Christianity, we would be living in a radically different world. The idea that, oh, I want this thing to happen, but I'm unwilling to work towards it. If that was viewed as the same type of sin uh, that some Christians view homosexuality as, like we'd be living in such a radically different world. And when I look at a government program, and I'm trying to analyze what that program is and why the government is doing this, uh, at this point in my life, I have basically started to ignore everything the government says they are trying to do. I, that's not relevant. Uh, what a program or a policy or an agency, the outcomes they achieve are what they're trying to do. Like, that's it. A program is what a program does. Uh, and so I often see this narrative of like, the drug war has failed. Uh, if only that were the case. Uh, I think in fact the drug war is substantially doing exactly what it's intended to do. Uh, it's intended to curtail our right to tell cops, like, no, you're not gonna look at my car. This is my property, like, fuck off. Uh, it's intended to curtail our religious liberty to uh, engage with our own minds and consciousness and connect with the universe in whatever way we desire. It's designed to lock up disproportionate numbers of young people of color. It's, it's working exactly as designed. And until we have a societal recognition of that fact, it's gonna be really, really hard to figure out how to end this. Uh, because we are talking about tremendous amounts of money and outcomes that are greatly, greatly desired uh, by people with structural power and resources. Uh, and it shows up in a lot of ways, but I wanted to talk about a couple. Uh, one of them is just near and dear to my heart because Dansafe manufactures so much drug checking equipment, and so it's a, a thing that I research quite a lot. Uh, and We've been, for a long time, we're trying to develop a better uh, cocaine reagent, a way to see if a substance actually contained cocaine. 
Uh, and I found one that was manufactured for law enforcement, uh, Scott's reagent. They claimed it worked very, very well. I was super excited. So I downloaded the MSDS, the Material Safety Data Sheet. If somebody sells something in this country, they have to tell you what's in it. Yay. Uh, so I downloaded the MSDS and sent it to our chemist, and we manufactured it. And it turned the same color blue for cocaine as it did with damn near everything else I put in it, including dirt, tree leaves, uh, lint, and air if you gave it about 25 minutes. So if you crack this uh, test, put it on the hood of the car, spend 25 minutes talking to this person, like, oh look, this was cocaine. That's not negligence. Um, I, I would testify under oath that in my opinion, it's designed to manufacture probable cause. That is the purpose of this law enforcement tool, is to manufacture the ability to search a person. Um, we were able to modify it in a way that it actually does work. And so we now have a similar reagent that works quite well. Um, the fact that I had to modify it, the fact that I could modify it, the fact that like me and a bunch of like amateur chemists were able to like make it work in the way it claims to, means it's design. Like that's what it means. But also if you just look at the drug war from a meta level, uh, the number of deaths now I, I don't believe are accidental. Um, I don't believe they are being done in the way that some people do, where it's like, oh, it's the DEA planting fentanyl in cocaine. Um, that seems less likely to me, mostly because you can't really keep secrets that well. But the head of the DEA under either the first or second Bush, I'm, I'm forgetting which, uh, said in open congressional testimony that the goal of the DEA was to make drug use so dangerous that only a crazy person would do it. He said it. This is a harm maximization policy, right? We want the thing to be so dangerous. Uh, it, the underlying logic is even crazier than that, though, right? It's like, the thing is so dangerous that we want to change the laws to make it so much more dangerous that nobody would do it. I mean, that's the sort of logic flow of, of the drug war. And so when you look at harm reduction as a way of prote protecting the sanctity of blessing, if we say as a society that we want less people to die from drugs, we are called to enact actions and policies and individual act acts in a way that will uh, increase the likelihood of that outcome, right? Which means as individuals learning how to test our substances or our friends' substances, it means learning how to use Narcan and carrying Narcan everywhere. It means voting for politicians who are willing to actually enact these policies. It means supporting the organizations doing this, this work. Uh, and it means not just ending this fight for increased access to substances with the substances that we may personally enjoy. It means recognizing that the drug war as a system is causing tremendous harm. Uh, and if the lessons of psychedelics are true, and if we are all one, and this is all sort of the, the Maya uh, of the universe, we have to behave that way. Um, or what were the lessons of psychedelics really worth? Right, if we, if we just sort of end our advocacy at keeping ourselves out of jail. Um, and there's this really famous story, it's been attributed to a handful of different people. I've seen it attributed to uh, uh, Maharaji, I've also seen it attributed to Babaji, who was uh, Ram Dass's guru that he wrote about in Be Here Now. Uh, for purposes of this talk, uh, we'll just pretend it was Babaji. Uh, as Dennis McKenna once told me, uh, Terrence never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, it was when I was complaining that, you know, he had that quote about if life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness don't mean the right to alter our consciousness, it's not worth the hemp it's written on. And it bugged the shit out of me because it's written on vellum. Uh, and when I told Dennis, he was like, no, no, like Terrence knew, it's fine. Like, don't, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. So we'll pretend it's Babaji. And the story is that this person comes to Babaji and says, uh, I really only have one question for you. Everyone says you're this like, in, you know, this living master of how to relate to the world. And the question was, how should I treat others? And Babaji's answer was, there are no others. There are no others. Uh, and so we can, we can relate to the world in that way. And, you know, these are, these are individual obligations. These are my views on my obligations for how I should relate to the world. Uh, I learned a long time ago to not try to uh, impose my, what I view as my obligations to the world on others. But whatever your 
personal traditions are, whether born into or uh, adopted by choice, whatever lessons you've taken from uh, your time spent in altered states of consciousness that so many of these just incredible, incredible, you know, plants, animals, fungi, and amphibians can provide to us, right? Thank you, amphibian medicine. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever you've learned from these things, uh, all traditions that I've researched throughout my life have had uh, different principles along these lines, right? Within Christianity, there's good works and acts of mercy. Uh, and again, I'm, this is uh, not to ignore the very, very valid criticisms of any of these traditions as political systems, but as religious and truth systems, I think they all have lessons to teach us. You know, the, the idea within Christianity of love thy neighbor, the idea that when you read it in the original language, the crime of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhosp inhospitality to strangers. That was the crime of Sodom was inhospitality to foreigners. You know, within Islam, there's sadiqa, which is not uh, zakat, which is like the financial giving, but sadiqa is uh, these broad, broad acts of charity to just ex extending kindness and assistance to those who need it. Within Hinduism, particularly the non-dualistic schools, there's seva, this idea of every act you do towards a person is an act of charity towards God. Right, which again, like shows up in Christianity, right? Whatever you have done to the least of those among you, you have done to me. Uh, you know, within Buddhism, there's metta, this loving kindness, unconditional love for the world. Uh, Sikhism, you know, there's sewa. This the, the Sikhs have these incredible, you know, uh, temples. Uh, the Golden Temple in Amritsar is the one to look up on the internet if you want to really see like what they do. Where for in some cases, hundreds of years. They've been cooking two or three meals every day. I mean, cauldrons the size of this stage. And any person, does not matter your religion, does not matter your wealth, does not matter your caste, can come into these buildings and sit and eat. Like, what an incredible thing for religion to do for hundreds of years without stopping to just feed their community because everyone deserves to eat. Just thinking of that as a controversial statement just breaks my mind. Everyone deserves to eat. Everyone deserves to be safe in their home. Everyone deserves to be able to alter their consciousness without fear of being put in handcuffs and locked in a box. Like, none of these should be controversial statements within our society. And so, yeah, I think we're really close to time. But uh, again, you know, these are, these are the ways I view these things. And whatever your traditions are, I encourage you to look for these areas where you can see the connections between how you view morality and how you might expand that view beyond the sort of uh, activism that I've so often seen within a lot of drug war spaces, right? I, I'm so, so grateful for the movement on pot legalization. It was a low-hanging fruit. It was the gateway drug policy, right? We were able to legalize pot, and now we're seeing so much better stuff happen. Uh, but from a pure public health perspective, maximizing the number of lives we save tomorrow, we should probably be talking about legalizing the most intrinsically problematic substances first, right? It's not, mushrooms being illegal is, is a crime against consciousness and a crime against humanity and a violation of our religious liberties, but it's not killing that many people, right? People's inability to access opiates is killing thousands, People have died within five miles of here while I was giving this talk is like almost a statistical certainty. Like that's, that almost certainly happened while I was on this stage. Uh, and so from a, a health perspective, from a political perspective, it's a much heavier lift. Uh, but from a health perspective, like I would really encourage you to think about why you may feel that you deserve the substances you like and others might not, why the drug war itself might be a little harder to kill if we don't kill it at the root. You know, pot was legalized in a lot of states in the 1960s and 70s, and we swung back the other way. I'm really excited about psilocybin being legal in some states, but like if we don't end prohibition as a system, those wins aren't permanent. They're not eternal. They can be clawed back. Uh, if we can get society to recognize that all humans have the right to own their minds and bodies,
that we are the sole sovereigns of our individual selves, uh, we might actually get out of this mess. Uh, and so thank you guys so much for coming out to hear me talk. And this was a really challenging one for me. And so, yeah, thank you.